Over the course of the next several videos, we're going to go through a proof of the optimality of Huffman codes. We are actually going to just do a proof of the case of B equals 2, that is when our code alphabet is binary. And for concreteness, let's take it to be the set 0, 1. Now, the general case of B greater than 2, say B equals 3, 4, 5, what have you, is very similar, but it's easier to sort of first get your head wrapped around what's going on in the proof by doing the case of B equals 2. The notation is a bit simpler, but once you get the general idea of what's going on, it's very easy to generalize to the more general case. So the setup is we have some source alphabet, X, and it's a finite set for a Huffman code, some finite set here. And so in this case, I'm denoting it the number of elements by n, so we'll say it has n elements. And we're going to have some PMF on this set, so P, P1 to Pn, is going to be some PMF on X. And we will be considering codes, uniquely decodable codes, and we'll denote their lengths by L1 to Ln, that is the length of the code word, for xi is li, so these are our lengths, and we're, we're, we're trying to minimize the expected code word length. We're trying to minimize the quantity l, so we're trying to solve the problem of minimizing l, where l is the sum of the lengths times the probabilities. It's the expected code word length. And we're minimizing this over the lengths, and we're considering all uniquely decodable codes. Equivalently, we can we, we will probably focus on prefix codes because minimizing over prefix codes is the same as minimizing over uniquely decodable codes, since by the Kraft-McMillan theorem, we know that for any uniquely decodable code, there's a prefix code with the same lengths, and so it can attain the same expected code word length. So the, what we're going to prove in, the, in, in proving the optimality of Huffman codes is that the Huffman coding procedure is guaranteed to always give you a code that has minimal expected code word length. It solves this problem, and it does so in a remarkably efficient way, in fact. And as we saw, it's not only efficient, but it's also very easy to implement. It's, it's very easy to understand the Huffman coding procedure for, you know, how to generate a Huffman code. What takes a bit more work and what we're going to do over the, over the next few videos is proving that those Huffman codes are in fact optimal. So that's going to take some work, but it will be well worth it since we'll, we'll then know that we can always get an optimal code by that procedure. Now, the first thing which might occur to you is the question of whether there even exists an optimal code. I, I'm claiming that Huffman codes are optimal, but actually the proof that, that Huffman codes are optimal uses, it depends on the existence of at least one optimal code. And it's actually a subtle thing that, that it's not actually immediately clear how to prove this. So our first little lemma, we're going to have a series of a bunch of lemmas building up to the main result of the optimality. And our first lemma is on the existence of an optimal code. And this will be important for proving that Huffman codes are optimal. So let's state the existence lemma. For any PMFP, I'll just say for any, I'll say any PMFP of this form, P1 to Pn, there exists, there exists an optimal prefix code, optimal in the sense of minimal expected code word length. Now, this fact is actually somewhat glossed over in most treatments of the optimality of Huffman codes. Most of the time, people just sort of assume this is true, but the proof is actually a little bit, you know, it's, it's not immediately clear how to actually write down a proof for this. So we're going to do that, but we're not going to do it right now. We're going to postpone that for, for a few videos down the road. 
All right, so let's suppose this to be true for the time being, and we will come back to it. And our, our next lemma, the lemma that we're going to focus on for the rest of the video, is the inverse ordering lemma. Inverse ordering. So we're going to have a series of lemmas here. The inverse ordering set lemma says something very intuitive, intuitively clear, which is that for any optimal prefix code, the lengths are inversely ordered with the probabilities. So let's make that precise. So for any optimal prefix code, any optimal prefix code, the lengths are inversely ordered. So in other words, for any indices j and k between 1 and n, if pj is greater than pk, then lj is less or equal to lk. So in other words, more probable symbols have shorter code words, or at least code words that are not longer. And it's actually intuitively sort of clear why this would have to be the case. Because otherwise, if the code word for this guy were longer than this one, then you could just swap the code words, you know, make a new code in which you swapped those two code words, and you would have a code with shorter expected length. So that seems intuitively clear, but let's actually go ahead and, and write down the proof of it, just to be, just to be complete. Oops. So the proof, I'm just going to make formal what I just said there. Just swap the code words. So let C be optimal prefix code and, you know, with lengths L. So we'll let L denote the lengths of C. And now we're going to construct a new code, C prime. And we're going to do it in the way that I just said. So we'll, so we'll let C prime such that, so let's denote actually the code words of C by, I'm going to start using this notation and probably in several videos. Let's call the code words of C W1 through WN. So each of these is some sequence of code symbols, like for example, WI is 01101, something like that, EG. Or, you know, more precisely, WI is just C of XI course. Okay. And we're going to define C prime so that W1 equal or, or rather WI prime, if WI prime is the ith code word of, of C prime, it's equal to WI for all I that are not equal to J or K. Not equal to J and for all I, let's maybe such that i not equal to j and i not equal to k. So here I'm I'm already maybe I should have inserted here somewhere. So we should so we should let we should assume that pj is greater than pk. So let's insert that somewhere in here. So suppose suppose pj is greater than pk. Put that at the beginning. Okay, so we have our, our these code words, but now we need to define code word wj prime, and we'll make this wk. We're just going to swap the jth and the kth code words, and then wk prime will just be wj. So this is our new code, c prime. And what can we say about the code word lengths for these two codes? Well, we know that, that c is optimal. So if its code word length is L sub C, then that certainly must be less or equal to the code word length of C prime. We'll call that L sub C prime. So if we just move this guy over, then we get L sub C prime minus L sub C is greater or equal to zero. And let's plug in the definitions and we'll just play around with this and, and see if we can get the result that we want. That's the definition of the expected code word length.
And what do we know about these, these lengths? Well, we, we defined this was our, our code, our C prime, and it seems, well, it's, it's clear that the, the lengths are going to follow similar relations. The lengths, so the lengths, we're going to have li prime equals li for all i not equal to not equal to j or k and we're going to have lj prime equal to lk and we're going to have, have lk prime equal to lj so it's, they satisfy the same exact relations as the code words so if we were to plug these in here what would we get so continuing this line now pink again Continuing this line, well, we know that li prime equals li for all except, you know, when we're not equal to j or k, so those terms just cancel. They just drop out, and we're left with lj prime pj plus lk prime pk minus lj pj minus lk pk. Okay, now what? Well, let's use let's use the definitions over here. We use these these facts. Let's now use these facts. So we know that LJ prime is LK. Let's go ahead and plug that in. We know that LK prime is LJ. Let's leave those the same. And see if we can simplify things a little bit here. What can we say about this? Well, here we have LKPJ, here we have LKPK, so let's factor out, let's factor out an LK. We get LKPJ minus PK, and can we do something similar here? Ah, yes, we have LK, so let's factor out L, or rather LJ appears in both. LJ, PK minus PJ, and can we simplify further? Well, here we have pj minus pk, pk minus pj, ah yes, so just factor out a minus one out of this dude, and what do we get? We get, oh, we, we, right, if we factor out minus one, then this is the same as this, and we get lk minus lj, pj minus pk. Okay, so we know that zero is less or equal to blah, 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 all this. Zero is less or equal to this guy. So zero, zero is less or equal to this. And what is this? This is pj minus pk, and by our supposition, pj is greater than pk. That's what we assumed. That's what we're so back to what, what we're trying to prove. We we're we're going to say okay, we have some optimal prefix code, and if pj is greater than pk, then lj is less or equal to lk. So that's what we're trying to show. We assume this, and we'd like to say that lj is less or equal to lk. And is it? Well, what can we do here? This is a positive quantity, since pj is greater than pk. And so, oh, so we can just cancel it, right? So this, you know, we know that this whole thing is greater than, greater or equal to zero, and this is a non-zero quantity, so we can just cancel that. So we get zero less or equal to LK minus LJ, or in other words, LJ less or equal to LK. Voila. So that is the proof of the inverse ordering lemma and it was it was pretty simple i mean we just you know made it very formal but it's it's just sort of stating this sort of very clear fact that if you have a more probable code word or a more probable source symbol then it's going to have to have a code word which is which is less or equal to the other guy since otherwise you could just swap them and get a better code